Precious Father, we are not worthy, Lord, to be here, but we thank you that the blood of Jesus permits us to come to your presence, to be here among your people. And Lord, we are praying that you may bless this message, bless me, give me strength, help me to lean upon thine everlasting arms, that the message that is going to be presented may be clear to the listener, and that we may walk away from this church believing and knowing, Lord, that we don't want to be just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to look today at the first coming of Jesus. And you may say, but Pastor Frank, why is that so important? We're not going to look at the details of how Jesus was born and where he was born, but we're more going to pay attention to the generation that Jesus came into when he first came, because it's going to shed light on how the condition of the generation will be when Jesus comes the second time. Does that make any sense? And friends, how many of you want to see the soon coming of Jesus? Amen? But in order for us to be able to see the second coming of Jesus, we need 2020 vision. We need discernment. We need the eye salve of the Holy Spirit to remove our blindness, our sp spiritual cataracts. A generation, we're living in a generation that Satan is doing all that he can to blind us. So I want to begin with first inviting you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 1, and I have it here on the screen. We're going to begin with verse 9 through 11. Here we find John speaking of Jesus first coming to the world. Notice what the Bible says. That was the true light. And I apologize for the typo there. It should say, which lighteth every man, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made by him. And what does it say there? And the what? The world knew him not. Now, my question to you, who does the world represent here in this text? And the Bible says, and the world knew him not. Who does the world represent here in the text? Well, let's continue. Verse 11, and he came unto his own, and his own received him not. What I believe John is trying to say is that when Jesus came to fulfillment of prophecy, when he descended and became flesh, when he came to this world in general, in other words, this secular world, the world knew him not. And you say, but pastor, but the good news is the church was ready for him. The church had the prophecies of old. They had the Old Testament, right, pastor? But the text tells us in verse 11 that he came unto his own. In other words, he came to them that had the Old Testament prophecies and his own received them not. So what John is trying to say is not only did the world not receive him. And that's kind of understandable because there was a secular world. But you would think that the church will be ready. You would think that the people of God, Israel, who knew the truth. Would know, but the Bible tells us, verse 11, that his own received him not. 
So when Jesus first came to this sin infested world, the majority of the world knew him not. Verse 11, not even his own people who had all of the prophecies of his appearance. The scripture tells us that instead it was these men from the east known as the Magi. The spirit of prophecy tells us that they actually had some prophecies. They didn't have it all. The, the Magi didn't have all the truth, but they had some prophecies and they had some understanding and they came to search for him. But his own people, Israel, did not perceive the promised one. Foretold by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 7, 14, where it says that he was going to be born of a virgin. Isaiah tells us that he will be called the Wonderful, the Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In the book of Micah, there in a prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, what does it say? But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over all Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So the Old Testament is littered with hundreds of prophecies of the coming of the Messiah. But when he came to the world, the world knew him not. And in his own people did not receive him. They didn't welcome him. Why? What was at the root of the problem? What does John chapter 3 verse 19 tells us? What does John 3, 19 says? And this is the condemnation. What is a condemnation? And this is a, what, what, what's John trying to say here? And this is the condemnation. In other words, here is the sentence. Here is the judgment. Here is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. This is the revelation of John explaining the great sin of that generation. And what was the great sin of that generation? That light is coming to the world, but men love darkness rather than the light. Now, who in their right mind will prefer darkness over the light? Why would anyone prefer darkness rather than the light? Well. Does not the text give us the answer? What does the text say here toward the end? Because their deeds were evil. Friends, sin is blinding. And you just lifted up your hands just a few minutes ago. You said that you want to see the soon coming of Jesus with your own eyes. Yes? Amen? But I want to tell you something. Sin is blinding. And when we are delighting in sin, we become so blind that we're not going to be able to see the coming of Jesus. The world, when Jesus came into this world the first time as a man, let me tell you something, and I, I don't think we understand this. And I'm going to shed some light here with the spirit of prophecy here. The world was engulfed in sin. And let me read from you from the Desire of Ages, page 36. And I hope this is a wake-up call, because if you understand this, if you understand the generation that Jesus came to when he first came the first time, it's going to help us understand where we're heading in this last generation. Notice what it says. Desire of Ages, page 36. The people, I got it here. The people whom God had what? Called to be the pillar and the ground of the truth have become the representatives of Satan. They were doing the work that he desired them to do. Taking a course to misrepresent the character of God. And the call and cause the world to look upon him as a tyrant. The very priest who ministered in the temple had lost sight 
of the significance of the service they perform. They have ceased to look beyond the symbol to the thing it signified. In presenting the sacrificial offerings, they were as actors in a play. The ordinances which God himself had appointed were made the means of blinding the mind and hardening the heart. God could do no more for man through these channels. The whole system must be what? Swept away. The deception of sin had reached its height. And all the what? Agencies for depraving the souls of men have been put into what? Operation. Now listen to this next passage. This, this is blew me away. You ready? It says, the Son of God, looking upon the world, beheld suffering and misery. With pity he saw how men had become victims of satanic cruelty. He looked with compassion upon those who were being corrupted murdered and lost, they had chosen a ruler who chained them to his car as captives. Bewildered and deceived, they were moving on in a gloomy procession toward eternal ruin, to death in which there is no hope of life, toward the night to which comes no morning. Now notice, satanic agencies were incorporated with men, and the bodies of human beings made for the dwelling place of God have become the habitation of demons. The senses, the nerves, the passions, the organs of men were worked by supernatural agencies in the indulgence of the vilest lust, and the very stamp of demons was impressed upon the countenance of men. Hello? How many times have you said, I wish I lived in the times of Jesus? Yes? I've said that. But what we forget is that was a wicked generation. Let me give you one more passage. Notice what it says here. Human faces reflected the expression of the legions of evil which were, they were possessed. Such was the prospect upon which the world's Redeemer looked. What a spectacle for infinite purity to behold. The Son of God the one that was blameless, the one that was without sin, came to look at a spectacle of humanity that was lost, that was possessed by evil spirits. The devil has a stamp upon their foreheads. And now I think we need to really understand this because in the book of John, we found two groups that Jesus came to. And he separates these two groups. One was the world, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his very own, and his own what? Did not receive him. Is history going to repeat? Look at the text. Let's go back to the key text, and we're going to understand this. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore... Thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, listen to the question, how great is that darkness? How great. If, if the world, if the world knew him not, if the world is not ready for him because it's a secular world, that's one thing, brothers and sisters. But if the church is not ready because we're playing with sin and, and, and this body that should be full of light, if our eyes are not single to the Lord, the question is, then how dense is that darkness? You see what Satan's trying to do? Satan is trying to get us dark. Beloved church, young man, young woman, and all of you that have been in this church, I don't know how many years you've been in this church. But let me tell you something. Them who were supposed to have the light, their vision was clouded with dense darkness. 
and the generation when the Redeemer came to the world, the spirit of prophecy tells us that they were captive, that they were bewildered, that they were deceived. Satanic agencies were incorporated with men and the bodies of humans became habitations of demons. And this is what the Redeemer of the world had to deal with when he came. Let me tell you, Jesus did not have it easy. You know what we call this whole area here, this whole region? Have you heard of the, you heard of the terminology, the Bible Belt? Let me tell you, there was no Bible Belt in the days of Jesus. Were they religious? Was his people religious? Yes, they were religious. But were they kind? Were they compassionate? Were they... Let me tell you, has anyone here been to Jerusalem? When you see, when you see how the, the religious Jews, the Orthodox, how they treat people, wow, it gives you a idea how cruel and how bad they must have been toward the Christians and toward those that believed in Jesus. Because you still see it today. Israel, who was supposed to be a light to the world, failed to fulfill their calling. And, and, and the chief priests and leaders gave a misrepresentation of the character of God. They didn't want to share the special truth that they had to other nations. And all of their symbolic meanings contained in the rituals and the ceremonies that were repeated in the temple that pointed to the coming of the Messiah and the plan of redemption was lost. The significance of the plan of redemption, that innocent lamb and the priestly functions all were evidences of how Jesus will come to save sinners, but they lost it all. How terrible is to be in the church all our lives and not understand what this thing is all about. You know what I'm talking about? When it, when, when it appeared that everything was lost, when the dim known pagan world was covered in darkness, someone had to bring light. And when God's people were groping in the dense darkness, unable to understand the significance of it all, someone had to come and bring liberty. And when the world was hungering for truth, someone had to come and break the bread of heaven. When Satan was exalting in a world that expressed the stamp of his countenance, someone had to come and lift up man and woman with his life and power, and that man has his name, and his name is Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior. Amen? John chapter 12, 46 tells us, I am come, what? I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me, shall not, what? Abide in darkness. Is there someone here in this gymnasium? Or perhaps someone that might be watching later the, 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 the message, either online or on, on the internet, that you personally feel that you are right now in a dense darkness. I want to tell you, in the name of Jesus Christ, the light of Jesus can pierce that darkness. Light has come, and where there is light, the darkness disappears, brothers and sisters. Jesus came the first time to uplift humanity, to show that in the person, the true character of his father, the glory of the Lord shone in the darkness. He healed the brokenhearted. He set the captives free. He came to proclaim victory to the hopeless. The message of Jesus, the message of salvation spread throughout the world through, with the help of his disciples. But friends, hello, 
That was 2,000 years ago. And you know, today, we're waiting for the promise of Jesus to be fulfilled, for him to come again. But what I'm seeing today in this final generation is a world that once again is falling, is falling, is falling into the dense darkness. After 2,000 years, we are returning back to the darkness. I see a few children here. I see a few youths, a few young people back there. And you know, I, I fear for the young people today. My nephews and my nieces being raised in this generation are experiencing, are seeing things that I never saw in my generation. This generation of youths are being raised in a culture. They're being exposed to a new order, being solicited by the new norm. And let me tell you something. The LGBT community, we know what that is, yes? The LGBT community. I'm going to kind of skip a lot of this section here, but let me just say this. God loves people within the LGBT community, amen? He loves all. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 15, that he didn't come to the world to condemn the world, but that that he may what? Save them. Save the world, right? However, when we look at the Bible, if there is anyone in the LGBT community that has a desire to be transformed, there is power in the name of Jesus. Amen? And Christianity should not be forced, should not be, it should not be something that should be forced upon people. Amen? Christianity should be only an invite, an appeal to whoever, whoever wants to come to the marriage supper of the Lamb, amen? They're invited to come. And this invitation is not only for the LGBT community, but it's for all of us that are here, because all of us are sinners. All of us need salvation. And the LGBT community is growing. And when I did this, I originally did this sermon in 2019, uh, when I studied this thing about the the New York, you, you heard of the New York gay uh, gay parade where it began in 2019. Cities after cities, new cities that have never participated in these parades. Now cities are doing the same that they're doing in New York, in Brazil. In Brazil, there was a parade that attracted 3.5 million people at the gay parade in Brazil. Cities in Africa, cities in Europe, in the UK, in Asia, in the United States, in South America. Gay pride celebrations are happening everywhere. But I praise God because there are some in that community that are experiencing the, the, the grace that God gives them to be transformed. Amen. And one of them is my cousin. And we're hoping that he will be coming soon to, 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 uh, to visit me over here, but he was on the news station over there in California. Him and a few other people were baptized, and it was televised where he belonged to this community. And now, amen, he is saved by grace, and uh, he belongs to the Seventh-day Adventist Church now. Jesus said, I have come not to, uh, I have, Jesus said, I have not come to the world to condemn the world, but to save it. So if there's anyone that desires to be transformed into the likeness of the image of God, there is power and there is hope and this invitation is for all of us. But our use of today are seeing, excuse me, and hearing of these movements around the world and the ears of the young people today are plugged in with the AirPods and with the headphones. You know, I have one of those things. You know, we, we plug in sometimes. But 
but but what I'm what I'm seeing is that a lot of our young people are plugged in to a lot of the musicians of the world. And they're taking a hold of so many. Years ago, when I visited Miami, when my niece was only about that tall, she's she's way up here now. But when she was a very young girl, I remember when I got to the house of my sister, one of my sisters down there, I remember that my 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 niece was tuned in and she was listening to this music by Hannah Montana. Have you heard of her? And Hannah Montana was was employed by Disney. And she was a musician and she was talented. And I remember uh, one of my sisters telling me that it was okay. She, she felt that I was overreacting. You see, when I came from the secular world and I came to Jesus, I surrendered the secular music. So when I saw one of my own listening to that music, I wanted to reach out. And I, re- and I remember that what my sister was telling me, and I've heard it from others at that time, they were saying that Hannah Montana is a Christian, and Hannah Montana claimed to be a Christian also. But brothers and sisters, we have to be very careful. What happened with Hannah Montana? You, you guys may already know. As she grew a little bit older, she began to change, and she became the megastar known as Miley Cyrus. And she came into this new persona after having thousands, millions of teens following her. She changed into this persona. And let me show you what these secular entities described Miley Cyrus. JYSK and AOL owned service recognize her as the worst celebrity influence. Culture and Media Institute criticize her for becoming the epitome of the anti-role model for young girls. And the New York Post, Naomi Riley, said after duping her audience was an inherent danger for younger children. A young Disney star who initially claimed to be a Christian, she later claimed to the world that she was pansexual and gender fluid. Her concerts and shows have been considered one of the most lewd and shameless acts. Brothers and sisters, it's a youth quake. Many of our young people are being shaken and sifted, and how many are leaving for all these influences of the world? And you say, Pastor Sierra, but we don't listen to Miley Cyrus because we're a little bit more sophisticated in this church. We, we like to listen to more classical music. We appreciate more, you know, nice voices. What about Celine Dion? Celine Dion had an incredible multi-million contract in Las Vegas for her voice. But she recently joined the fashion industry and she came out with this new, with this new, uh, clothing lined with two other women that I believe influence her in a powerful way. Celine Nu Nu Nu. Have you heard of it? It's a new clothing line. You see, in this ad, it's very interesting. She's in a car. And how is she dressed? In a dress, right? In a dress. And notice the bag that she has. If you measure, if you measure that, what looks like a cross from the, the, from the picture there, how does it look like? Does it look like an upside down cross? If you measure the, 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 the white, you see the white, the top part of the white, and you see the other side, which side is longer? Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Is that just coincidence? But see, this flashes, this is a video, by the way. This is actually a video, but I, I took the, the, the pictures from it to show you the stills. So let's continue here. So she has a bag and she's in the car and there's a narrator that her voice is being heard in the video. And she starts talking about the children of this world 
And you know what she says in the in the ad? And it shows on the bottom in the video. It says, your children, anyone have children? Your children are not your own. Hello? If your children are not your own, then who, who do they belong to? Who does she think your children belong to? And as the ad continues, she's riding in this car and she's speaking and she's beginning to unravel this new norm, the new order. And where is she going? She goes into a maternity ward. And what does, what do you have there? Babies. You see the boys and you see the girls. You see the blue and you see the pink. You see the gender icons on the walls. You see the, the girls, you see the, the pink over here on the right. You see the boy uh, icon on the left. So you see the two genders. And what does she do? She opens, uh, how is she dressed now? How is she dressed now? What happened to the dress? What happened to the feminine dress? Now how is she dressed? More neutral and all in black. Well, let's continue. She opens up the bag, and what does she pull out of the bag? She pulls out a small box, pink and blue, the babies. She pulls out a little black box, a little magic, and she blows the magic into the whole room, the maternity room. And what do you think happens now? It's gone. The girls and the boys are gone. The gender distinction of what a boy is and a girl is disappeared. The pink and the blue has, has gone away. And to replace it, you have the black and the white. And you have these crosses everywhere. But if you notice closely, and because this projector, the lighting is not as good. But if you notice on the right, what do you see in the cribs? Does this have laser? Oh, let's go back. But do you see the little monsters? The dolls? One of them's peeking out over there with the big eyes, the one on the right with the teeth. So not only is the boys and the girls distinction is gone, they've added a few little puppets that appear like monsters. And these are the pictures, these are the pictures from their Instagram that promotes this, and they took it down after a lot of protests, but I was able to get the pictures before they pulled them down. If you notice the picture on the bottom right, and again, because of the projector, we can't see the contrast here. You can see it on my computer, but she has antlers, antlers. And you know what antlers represent in the occult world? That's a very uh, typical image of, uh, of the occult. When you, when you have antlers, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's represents satanic, uh, it represents the devil. That girl is wearing antlers, but you, it's hard to distinguish it. Uh, we'll go back to this picture soon. They have the boy here in the picture with the skeleton, uh, over his eyes. And notice you can see one eye. And that is on purpose. Okay. That is uh, a symbol of the occult, the one eye, the one seeing eye. We continue. We have the girl with the one eye, again, on her shirt. Now, because when I put the picture here, it got cut off, but her socks, they're black cats with these evil-looking eyes, okay? The baby over here with the skull, okay? Skulls on the clothing. And uh, here's a closer picture. The stars, and what is the baby wearing over the head? Brothers and sisters, how many of you, when you want to dress up your baby, you're thinking about horns over their heads? Do you think something has captured Celine Dion and her team? An evil spirit has captured her, brothers and sisters. And I can, there's another picture that's so bad that I didn't even put it where I slow, really, I, I slow down the video and I captured her eyes before and after it's an evil look that I, I, I'm not sharing it on here. But let me go back to 
What does the shirt say? New order. And is any of these kids smiling? Now, notice this picture. There's a girl with what? What does she have on her head? A goat head. What does the goat head represent? In the occult world, this is a representation of the devil. And what is she holding in her arms? A book. And which direction is the book facing? It's facing you, yes? And you know what I had to do? When I first spoke this message, I never noticed it. But when I looked at my computer, I said, what is on that page? And I zoomed in. And you know what's in that cover? It's another man slaying another man. And just in case, uh, well, let me go back here. Let me go back here. You see the uh, girl on the right top? What does she have over her eye? Lightning. A lightning bolt. Do you know what, do you understand what the lightning bolt signifies in the occult world? The lightning bolt in the occult world is a, a symbol of Satan. When Jesus said in the Bible, and I saw Satan fall as lightning, yes? And you say, but pastor, you're stretching a little bit. That lightning could be anything. Well, let me show you the evidence. This hat on the left is what you can buy on Amazon or buy in at certain locations. But this is for the occult. You have the pentagram. You see the pentagram? What is in the center of that pentagram? The lightning bolt. But then you say, well, give me more evidence. Look at the right. You know the satanic Bible, where it came from? And the satanic church? It came from Anton LaVey. He passed away, but his son on top, Stanton LaVey, presents that we're doing something special, um, a, a special conference. And this is the ad that the family of the LaVeys came up with. And what is at the center of the ad? The pentagram, and what is in the center of the pentagram? Do I need to show you any more evidence? The lightning bolt is a symbol of Satan in the occult world. Yes? Marilyn Manson, the musician, uses the lightning bolt as one of his symbols. And who's the girl on the right? Lady Gaga. <laughs> okay? She's a famous celebrity that makes millions. One, uh, one of the top mega stars in the last, uh, 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 what, 10, 15 years, who's made millions, has reached so many people. And who's this? Have you heard of Harry Potter? Harry Potter, the, on the baby, when he was a baby, when the series began, he had the lightning bolt where? On his forehead. And now that he's older, you see the lightning bolt right there by his hair. Now, the people, the creators will say, oh, no, 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 this doesn't signify the devil. But the devil has many of them being used as puppets. So my question for you, brothers and sisters, is this world becoming dark? Look at his company. This is a company that is based in Canada. It's an ice cream company. It's a new company that sells ice cream. What does it say there on top? Sweet Jesus. What does the S, what is the S replaced with? A lightning bolt. This is a company that blasphemies Christianity. They make fun of Christianity. Look at the sweet Jesus there. Uh, sweet, the T is flipped upside down, the cross upside down, okay? What is the girl wearing over her head on the left? The antler horns, the, remember, this is a cult language here, okay? What we saw previously with Celine Dion, and uh, so there's so much stuff in these pictures that is all pointing to the occult. But brothers and sisters, uh, it's not just in the music industry. It's not just in the movies. It's cities around the world. This new order of things is in our high schools, in our sports. And the trans community are now winning in every kind of sports. They're winning championships in sw swimming, in track, in wrestling, in boxing. You name the sport, 
And again, this is the new order. So here is Rachel McKinnon, the, 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 the person in the center. She, she won the gold medal in world cycling competition for women. But you know what the problem is? Rachel McKinnon is not a real female. She's a male who trans into a female. And she won. Here is Mac Bags winning the championship in high school wrestling, state of Texas, for the second year in a row. But the problem is, he's not a woman. But he's wrestling. He's, he's, he's identified as a woman, and he's beating up these other women. Winning. This is what our young people are being exposed to. And it's becoming the new norm. This is Fallon Fox. MMA fighter, professional fighter, martial arts, who is a trans, who identifies as a woman, who fights other women, and in one fight, he broke the skull of a woman in a fight. Beloved church, this is the new order of things that has become the new norm. And the world is becoming dark once again. But what concerns me more is not what's happening in the secular world. What concerns me more is what's happening in the body of Christ, the church. God is calling his church to be the light to the world. But if our eye be not single, but be evil, then how great is that darkness? If, if we're playing with sin, how great is that darkness? The hope has no, the world has no hope. And the tears which Christ shed upon Olivet as he stood overlooking the chosen city were not for Jerusalem alone. In the fate of Jerusalem, he beheld the destruction of the world. Notice, if thou hast known, if thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. They are what? You had the truth. You had the prophecies of the Old Testament that I was the Messiah and all these things you rejected and now the truth is hidden from thine eyes. No discernment. They couldn't see the first coming of Jesus and do you think that we're going to be able to see the second coming of Jesus? Yet. Yet. I'm going to read here. I don't have it on the screen, but I have it here. This is uh, Christ's Object Lessons for those that are taking notes. Page 302. Uh, it says here. Yet the world is asleep. The people know not the time of their visitation. In this crisis, where is the church to be found? And its members meet, are the members meeting the claims of God? Are they fulfilling his commission and representing his character to the world? Are they urging upon the attention of their fellow men the last merciful message of warning? Men are in peril. Multitudes are perishing. But how few of the professed followers of Christ are burdened for these souls? The destiny of a world hangs in the balance. But this hardly moves even those who claim to believe the most far-reaching truths ever given to mortals. There is a lack of the love which led Christ to leave his heavenly sanctuary, his heavenly home, and takes man's nature that humanity might be touched with humanity and draw humanity to the divinity. There is a stupor, there is a paralysis upon the people of God which prevents them from understanding the duty of the hour. Testimonies to the church, I continue to read here in volume 6, amongst earth's inhabitants, scattered in every land, there are those that have not bowed the knee to Baal, and like the stars of heaven, which appear only at night, these faithful ones will shine forth when darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people. In heathen Africa, in the Catholic lands of Europe, 
of South America, in China, in India, in the islands of the sea, and in all the dark corners of the earth, God has in reserve a firmament of chosen ones that will yet shine amidst the darkness, revealing clearly to an apostate world the transforming power of obedience to his law. And I want to add Rome, Georgia. Amen? Even now, they are appearing in every nation, among every tongue and people. And in the hour of deepest apostasy, when Satan's supreme effort is made to cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive under the penalty of death the sign of allegiance to a false rest day, these faithful ones, blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, will shine as lights in the world. The darker the night, the more brilliantly will they shine. Would you say amen to that? And when the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, the true sheep will hear the true shepherd's voice and self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost. And many who have strayed from the fold, hallelujah, many who have strayed from the fold will come back to follow the great shepherd. Amen, brothers and sisters. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. And after this, I saw another angel descending from heaven with great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his glory. Even though the world today is becoming dark, and even though Christianity appears to be losing its light, Jesus will pour his spirit and the light of the glory of Jesus and his truth will be seen among his people. Then we will be able to see Jesus coming again in all of his glory. Amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, as I close this message, I want to end with an appeal. Are you in that dense darkness? Is there sin in your life? Do you feel that you are asleep? Oh, brothers and sisters, look at the folks around you right now. Look at the people around you. This is your family. This is brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to experience a revival, amen? We need to allow Jesus to come into our hearts. So I want to take this moment right now. As, a, as, a, as, a, as Jesus knocks on the doors of your heart, are you willing at this moment to tell Jesus, Lord, please come back into my heart. Reignite me. Give me the vision, the 2020 vision that I need to see, that I can see your soon second coming. If that is your desire, if that is your hope, and you want to be of those, of those people that are going to shine as the firmament, that you're going to shine in the darkness, if you want to be of those people, would you bow your heads at this moment and have a word of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, O oh Lord God, we come to you this morning needing for you to come into our lives. We've drifted. We, we're lacking our spiritual life with our time and devotion with you. We're not praying sufficiently. And Father, we bring this to your feet and we ask you, Lord, to please forgive us, cleanse us, purge us, and renew in us a right spirit. Oh, Father, return unto us the joy of your salvation. For we ignite in us the flame that it can burn and burn and burn until you come again, oh, Father. Lord, please, we ask you, to bless each person that is gathered around each table here, each family that is being represented. You know each one by name. Oh, Father, and in a special way, Lord, we want to dedicate the children here, the young, 
the young children and the teens that are here in our midst, please, Father, we ask you that you may take him into your hands and do what you have to do to save them, O oh Father. Never leaving them alone, but constantly reminding them that you love them and that you need to use them to do a final work in this world. We thank you and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you.